know, there was a time where I was simply a consumer and not a dealer. But because I was very keen on smoking uh, cannabis, I wanted to try more and more of it. I wanted to smoke more and more of it. I wanted to try different types of, of cannabis and became what's known as a dealer, which I suppose looking back is nothing more than having more, more marijuana than I could smoke. But uh, I did become a dealer and financed my own cannabis use as a result of very small time dealing. Uh, that over a period of about five years, I suppose, something like that, that increased, my dealing activities increased uh, until at some point it became obvious that that was my career rather than the pursuing the academic course that uh, I was doing. Uh, and then, yes, then I was risking by driving, I suppose, something like up to about a hundred kilos in my car around London through through roadblocks and things like that. Then it became risky. But the more, I, the longer I'd been taking those risks, the more used to I was, I became to being a risk taker. And therefore it, it just almost seemed to be normal to taking these, re, these risks. And of course getting away with it all the time. And everyone I know getting away with it pretty much all the time, gave, I don't know, there's a false sense of security or real sense of security, but made me confident enough to expect the gamble to pay off. I suppose my awareness of, uh, of risk generally uh, began properly when I, when I consciously became a fugitive. I consciously became a fugitive uh, because I was looking at uh, four years in prison if I didn't become a fugitive and decided I would prefer to become a fugitive. I don't think there was any risk involved there, it was just a decision I made. But because as a result of, uh, as a result of making that decision, then I had a threshold where I was taking a risk anyway and that I was a fugitive and could be arrested uh, just for walking down the road, for existing, really. Um, so the question then was whether, how to make money, whether to risk further time in prison, whether to do work that I knew, which I was fairly professional at, i.e. smuggling uh, marijuana to survive, or whether I should pretend to be a geography teacher in a, with a false name somewhere. Uh, I decided uh, to increase my uh, my smuggling activities, uh, and therefore I suppose that's when I realised yes, now no, I'm not just risking four years in prison. I'm now possibly risking twelve years in prison. But the difference, even though it's a difference of degree, there wasn't, there wasn't much kind of awareness of difference in kind at all. As a fugitive, uh, I had to decide whether to travel or not. And if I decided to travel, I would have to have a travel document, a passport, which enabled me to do it. I didn't have one. Uh, that had been surrendered because uh, I skipped bail. Uh, so I acquired other passports. Uh, one of the first I acquired, uh, I acquired was uh, an Irish passport in the name of uh, Peter Hughes. And I remember being very, very nervous about using that for the first time uh, for a number of reasons. One, it, I was traveling between two countries where neither of which I'd lived in, Ireland and, uh, and Brussels, actually, to Belgium, I was traveling there. Uh, and therefore, breaking a few more laws, entering into a country uh, with false identity, having acquired yet used, applied for a false passport. Uh, I remember thinking this is definitely up in the stakes a bit now. I'm you know, involving jurisdictions of more than one country, etc. And nevertheless flew, thinking it was uh, not so much a matter of necessity, but necessity if I wish to travel, I would have to do this sort of thing. I would have to get used to traveling around with false false identities. Um, and I flew, 
from Dublin, nothing happened there, no one seemed to take any notice. And then landed in Brussels and went to the immigration officer, presented my passport in the name of Peter Hughes to him. And he did the usual, that special look that passport uh, checkers have, you know, they look at you once, twice, three times. He looked at me and said, ah, Howard. I could have just like fell through the floor. I mean, how on earth did this sort of Belgian immigration officer know my name was Howard? I just you know, gave up. I just thought the odds were definitely against me without my realizing it. Uh, but of course, he was referring to Howard Hughes, who was um, uh, in the news at that time. And just seeing the name Hughes made him think of Howard Hughes, so he said the name Howard. It had nothing to do with him, uh, with his being able to uh, work out who I was. So that's when I thought I was taking a much bigger risk than I was. So I continued to use false passports as a result of that experience with a lot more confidence than before.